Please join me in welcoming Sean McAuliffe to lead today's discussion. Good luck. Thanks, everyone. It's really nice to be here today. Um, I do, I've always wished I was an architect, kind of like George Costanza on Seinfeld. Um, so, but this feels like the closest I'll ever get. Um, so thank you for having me. Uh, but as an outsider to architecture, um, it's really heartening to see that the theme of this, um, uh, the theme of everything here is inspiring climate action. Um, and we're seeing sort of an all hands on deck of almost all industries, um, some are a little bit uh, slower, of, of trying to address the crisis. Um, and it's really great to see you know, the people who are building stuff uh, to be um, really on top of it. And I was really struck by the uh, stat that was in the, the, the blurb for this, uh, for this uh, panel, that um, there's estimates suggesting that buildings are responsible for nearly 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the architecture profession takes that duty uh, to the public to find uh, better ways, uh, says the OAA. So that's really wonderful, again, as, a, as an outsider. But we've got three really fantastic people, experts, who are going to talk about regenerative architecture with us. Um, and the first I'll introduce is Craig Applegath. He's an architect, urban designer, and zero carbon building pioneer. And Craig is the founding partner of Dialogue. Uh, Craig, why don't you tell us a little bit about your work? might be a little bit of a lag here. I do feel like this is my first Anderson Cooper moment of people beaming in uh, from the satellites. Well, if Craig has lost his signal, maybe I'll move on to Nina Marie Lister. Well, I'll tell you who Nina Marie is. Uh, she's a professor and graduate director at the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Toronto Metropolitan University, formerly known as Ryerson. Oh, sorry, here you are. There's Craig. Hi, Sean, can you hear me? Yep, we gotcha. So, so have you just given an intro, do you want me to go into my quick background? Yeah, tell us a bit about your work. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll share my screen and give you a few slides, given we're presenting to um, architects here. I thought that uh, you'd want to see some um, slides. Can you see that? Yep, all good. Okay, great. So, um, Thanks very much for the, the intro. I put a few slides together that will give you a sense of where I'm coming from in this, in this uh, discussion today. Um, I uh, received a Bachelor of Science in Biology from the University of Toronto, specialized in ecology, a Bachelor of Architecture from Dalhousie University, and then a Master of Architecture and Design from Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, in 2003, I left Dunlop Architects and Stantec purchased it to found the Toronto Studio of Dialogue. Um, Dialogue's an integrated design studio with five cities, or uh, in five cities across North America. Our mission is used to use design to meaningfully improve the well-being of our communities and the environment they share. For the past five years, I've led three projects that I think are good examples of some of the key precepts that underpin regenerative design. The first is the award-winning Bill Fish Forester Chip Center in York Region. It was the first seven pedal living building challenge project in Canada and is net zero energy, net zero water, and constructed from sustainably harvested mass timber, which is key. The second is Centennial College, a zero carbon mass timber indigenously inspired lab and classroom facility on which we collaborated with Aladia Smoke. And the third is a 105 story hybrid wood, super tall mixed use zero carbon tower prototype. That's a mouthful. Um, this project was designed with the purpose of maximizing the use of sustainably harvested wood in a net po uh, positive carbon high-rise structure in an economically viable way. And we were really pleased last year when it won Fast Company's most innovative idea of 2021. It's always nice to have your ideas <laughs> recognized. Um, in addition to my architecture and urban design practice, I am also the co-chair of the Mass Timber Institute at the University of Toronto. Our mission is to establish Canada as a global leader in mass timber research and education and the development of uh, and export of sustainable mass timber product and technologies. I'm also an investor and board member of a growing forest company in Nova Scotia, a company that buys uh, ecolo and ecologically manages the forest woodlots to prevent them from being clear cut and to provide a supply of sustainably harvested wood as well as carbon offsets. And finally, every two months I produce a podcast called 21st Century Imperative, which explores what I believe are the three most important challenges we face 
this coming, this century. They are how we continue to live on our planet without destroying our biosphere, how we successfully adapt to the escalating impacts of climate change, and how we repair and regenerate the environmental damage we've already caused. I would argue that all three questions are very germane to our panel discussion this morning. So I hope that gives you a good sense of where I'm coming from. Great, thank you, Craig. Uh, now we'll move on to Nina Marie Lister, uh, who is a professor and graduate director of the School of Urban and Regional Planning at Toronto Metropolitan University, until very recently known as Ryerson, uh, where she founded and directs the Ecological Design Lab and is a visiting professor of landscape architecture at Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. So Nina Marie, tell us about uh, your work a bit. Thanks, Sean. Um, how lovely to be here with you all, virtually and in person for those of you who are joining in person. Um, yeah, the work that I do connects people to nature and cities every day. And I suppose the reason that I get to sit here with the architects is that I work at the interstitial space between landscape and architecture. We think every day about landscape connectivity, connecting the living landscapes to the buildings and to the cities in which we live and work. The work in our ecological design lab tries to make a healthier future for people in ways that we can understand that are scaled from the individual home and yard to the community, to the block, to the region, potentially. I really enjoy working with architects and landscape architects because the work that we do is essentially a hinge. It's integrative between the building, actually building beyond the envelope into the landscapes that sustain us in food, in mental and physical health and well-being, and the other species all around us that do this as well. We link art and science and design in our work, and if you'd like to look at the ecologicaldesignlab.ca, you'll see lots of examples of that work that range from pollinator meadows in the front yard at very vernacular and personal scale to large public parks and gardens, and most recently to connected green infrastructure in the form of living walls, green roofs, and in particular, the world's largest wildlife crossing, which crosses the Pacific 101 in California. It's uh, ostensibly for a cougar, to reconnect the Hollywood Hills cougar called P-22 to the Sierra Mountains behind, and really to connect the ocean back to the mountains as a landscape living surface for people and wildlife, although not all in the same place. Uh, these are examples of how we can scale across landscapes to connect people to nature, and also, most importantly, to recognize that we are part of a living environment, and our buildings and our landscapes can show this in very contemporary and engaging ways that allow us to do much more than just survive, but thrive and flourish. So flourishing in a city that is not just doing no harm, but actually doing better is, I hope, the conversation we're going to have today. How to flourish in relationship, in regenerative ways that do better. So thanks for having me today. I look forward to our conversation. Thanks, Nina Marie. Uh, and our third panelist is Michael Pollan. Uh, he's an expert in regenerative design and biomimicry. Ministry, ministry. I had to pronounce this a few times myself, and I'm not doing it right. Um, uh, he established his firm, Exploration Architecture, in 2007 to focus on high-performance buildings and solutions for the circular economy. Uh, Craig, tell us a bit. Uh, sorry, um, Michael, tell us a bit about your work. Great. Uh, thanks very much for that introduction, and thanks for involving me today. So I set up my company, Exploration about 15 years ago, and um, for a lot of that time, I was working on transformative projects. So bringing together teams of people to try and reimagine existing building types, and in some cases, create completely new building types. And um, that was a, a mixed success, if I'm honest with you. And um, one of the most common reasons we were given for projects not proceeding was that these ideas are great, but the market's not ready for them. Uh, which was quite frustrating. And when uh, the IPCC report was issued in 2018, that was quite a turning point for me, really, because I realized that most of what we had been doing as an industry in sustainable design for the last 20, 30 years had not got us anywhere near to where we need to be. And so I decided that I needed to embark on two major new collaborations, one of which was a group called Architects Declare a Climate and Biodiversity Emergency, which I'm delighted to say is spread now uh, around the world. It's been picked up by other people. And the second was a, a co-authored book called Flourish, Design Paradigms for Our Planetary Emergency. 
And both of these were based on the idea that comes from the systems thinker Tonella Meadows, that the best way to change a system is to try and change the mindset or paradigm that really drives how that system behaves. And so my co-author and I became convinced that we really need to make this urgent shift from sustainable to regenerative design. And back then in 2018, there were people talking about regenerative design, but there wasn't a great deal of clarity about what it meant. And so we set out to try and um, explore this and clarify it in our book. And we've argued that there are gonna be really five fundamental shifts that we need to bring about. And each of those is the basis of a chapter. So the first one we call possibilism. And this ex uh, explores the whole idea of agency and how we can maximize our capacity to bring about change. The second important shift is rethinking our relationship with the rest of the living world so that we no longer see ourselves as separate from nature, but rather as an integral part. And I realize that many people as individuals would not regard themselves as separate from nature. But the key thing is that the way our economies operate does treat nature as an externality that can be plundered for resources. And that's what really needs to shift. The third chapter is about rethinking time and uh, making the case for longer time scales of thinking and planning, and also more qualitative uh, understanding of time so that we can reconnect with cyclical time and rethink, rethink our ideas of progress. In chapter four, we rethink human nature uh, and what it would look like if we designed the built environment based on a more enlightened idea of human nature. So less about competition and more about uh, recognizing our, our really unique capacity for cooperation and empathy and altruism. In the uh, fifth chapter, we take on the, the big subject of growth and we make the case that neither growth nor degrowth by themselves are good purposes to drive our economic system. And what we should be aiming for as the ultimate purpose is for the maximization of planetary health. In the conclusion, we draw these strands together in a kind of crescendo of positivity and make the point that the present moment requires us to rethink our role as designers so that we increasingly inhabit a new deep purpose as co-enablers of the flourishing of all life for all time. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Uh, so the first, um, we wanted to start with something inspiring and maybe put something, um, not to use a cliche, but concrete or wood um, in front of us to really kind of be able to visualize what uh, a regenerative architecture or a regenerative city might actually look like. Um, and so I'd like to pull a bit, uh, some of you touched on this already, um, pull out what's the difference between sustainability and regenerative architecture. And then maybe tell us about an example of something that exemplifies that, uh, either your work or somebody else's. Craig, you showed us some um, buildings that you uh, said were regenerative. Maybe you could tell us what is regenerative about them. Yeah, and, and my background here is uh, the interior of the Bill Fish Forest Stewardship Center. And, and I think, t to me, sustainability is about doing less harm, whereas at its best, regenerative design is about um, a reciprocity with natural systems, where you're actually, what you do is going to improve or, or at least facilitate the health of natural ecosystems specifically. So I think, uh, unlike you know, a lead building or a very green building and the kind of terminology we've been using to date, um, I, I don't think it's something, a set of, of techniques or checklists for a building design per se, it's looking at the bigger system, the bigger ecological system and the, the building's impact on it. So to specifically answer your question, I think one of the tools that we can use now is um, mass timber because it has systemic impacts. Um, it reduces embodied carbon um, through its um, uh, sourcing and manufacture and fabrication and so forth. Um, it also, if it's done properly, if, if it's done in a way that uh, creates a more ecologically healthy forest, then it actually can improve 
forest ecosystems. That's why I, I signed up as a, as a board member for Growing Forests. And, and um, it also can suck up CO2 out of the atmosphere. So that's just one example. Um, another, which I won't go into in detail, is um, increasing density in cities in a healthy way so that we're doing less uh, suburban sprawl as populations increase, which is just a hugely detrimental to natural ecosystems around us. So I think that we have to think systematically. Um, architects typically don't. They think about buildings as objects that they're designing, um, but we have to get out of that, that that box, so to speak, and think more holistically. That's why it's always worthwhile having a landscape architect to talk to. It's been interesting in Toronto to see um, wood buildings going up because we've been talking about it for a bunch of years. And if you go down Queen's Key on a break, well, it's a little too far away, but on the Queen's Key East, um, there's a wood building going up. And I rode by it the other day, and like the smell of wood was really present. So it made itself really known uh, on the street, which was really uh, kind of nice to see something tangible after talking about it for so long. Um, how, Nina Marie, how about you? What is there an example of uh, regenerative architecture that you like to point to? is just that he's laid a good foundation for us, so to say. Um, regenerative architecture and design, let's use it more broadly, has to do with the way we think about and approach designing anything that begins with extraction. And I will maybe be somewhat provocative for the architects, but to say that there is no architecture without land, and land is life. So we start from a, in reducing our extraction potential, which also includes dispossession of people from land. So let's think about this integratively and systemically. Um, Michael has touched on this as well and written about it. Um, we have lots of original research in transformative systems thinking for the last 50 years that remains largely untapped. Regenerative design is actually about doing it better. So Michael has written about this in terms of moving beyond net zero. We talk about it a lot in our institutional teaching and in our research. So I come from the research side. We build the data sets. We collect the original information that helps our design teams understand how they can do better through thinking systemically. And it's more than just having multiple hats around a design table. We don't just talk to the landscape architect. We need deep engagement with people on land, with landscape architects for sure, but also with ecologists and those who understand how these materials that we're using affect the non-human species that actually sustain us. Our pollination and food systems are connected to the foods, to the, to the buildings that we make and the cities in which we live. So while this sounds like, like it's an expanding universe becoming too big for any one project, we're always tethered back to the site and we're reminded that the building is not, as Craig said, an object in the landscape, but there's actually a living land around that building. So how do we integrate with that? To answer your question more specifically, I refer to one example that may seem detached from architecture, moving wildlife and people, people safely across roads. How's that connected to architecture? Well, it's connected to how we live and engage in cities. So that's one example of thinking about the architecture of a bridge, which might be typically relegated to a bridge engineer, that's actually a living landscape surface in the context I, I pointed to. There are many buildings that our architects will know about um, that are touching on these concepts, but I think, Michael, you'll say maybe a bit more about this, but we know that the information that we need is out there and whether or not there's a market for it, that's a huge issue at sitting on the edge of climate catastrophe and an extinction crisis. So we really need to think integratively, systemically, and how to transform. Yeah, Michael, you want to take over? Yeah, sure. So adding, and perhaps to some extent, instead of repeating or reiterating what Craig and Nina Marie have said, I, I think there are three really fundamental differences between sustainable and regenerative. So that the first is that sustainable tended to be about mitigating negatives, just trying to be less bad. And we know that, that is not good enough. We need to get above, at least above the line of neutrality uh, into a realm of, of optimizing positives in, in every respect that we can. Uh, another key one that, that both Craig and Nina Marie touched on is is a, a shift from rather mechanistic ways of thinking to much more systemic uh, views. And that is going to involve embracing complexity and, and more sophisticated ways of actually um, analyzing the site and, and assessing how we're doing in response to that. And then the third important one is, is the shift from an anthropocentric perspective, so a, a 
human only focus to a bio-inclusive one. And in, in many ways, this is about expanding our, our idea of, of, of we, you know, um, the kind of evolution of human consciousness in many ways has been moving towards a, a wider and wider sense of we, starting with an individualist mindset, and then a tribal one, and then a national one, and then a global one. And now we need to cultivate a, a planetary perspective that sees us as, as connected to, to the, the whole of, of nature. And for me, we're still at quite an early stage. I think this debate is wide open. Um, and uh, we need just as lively a debate about this uh, as we had with sustainable design. And we need to ask ourselves, you know, what's the ultimate in re regenerative design? I agree with those such as the Regenesis group who argued that we, we need to strive to get to the point where we've completely overcome our separation from nature. And we are co-evolving as nature. And I think that's going to involve a lot more than just sustainability with all the norms turned up. It's going to require us to completely rethink what it means to be human and, and what our, our role is. And uh, one quick example, uh, and this is less about the way things look and more about the way things work. For me, one of the most important models that we can learn from biology is ecosystems models. So conventional human-made systems have tended to be linear, wasteful, fossil fuel-based, extractive. Ecosystems are the opposite. They're densely interconnected and interdependent. They run on zero waste, entirely on solar energy. And importantly, they are regenerative to their place. And this was something that we explored, my company that is, on a project called the Sahara Forest Project, which was partly a, a technical project about how you can bring technologies together in synergistic ways. And it also restored an area of, of desert. And we showed that in quite a short space of time, we could make a substantial improvement. Uh, you know, if you create the right um, uh, conditions for nature to return, it, it does have a, an amazing capacity to regenerate. Yeah, Michael, you mentioned um, Architects Declare uh, before, and it was, it was a big kind of public gesture. Um, you know, I read about it he, over here, and um, I'm wondering if you could just tell us a bit more about that, and what was, how it was, how was it received? Was it received with cynicism? Was it received positively? Just to kind of, doing such a public thing, you gauge the um, kind of wider public sentiment. So how did, how did that land? Sure, okay. So, um well, just, just before I get into that, uh, thanks to many of the people in, in Canada, Canada was one of the first countries to, to sign up after us, so we, we made it as easy as possible for other countries to make their own declarations and, and set up Architects Declare in, in their countries. And when we um, conceived of this, the, the intention was to encourage the shift towards regenerative design, it, and it, it, primarily in, in two ways. Firstly by getting our own house in order as a profession, and secondly, by pushing for higher level systems change. So on the first of those, the way we did that was that we wrote the declaration points to be aligned with regenerative design, and we've organized events and shared knowledge, and we're trying to be as mutually supportive as possible. And um, you know, we, we, we would have liked to have achieved more, but um, we have noticed a big increase in the amount of interest in regenerative design, so, so that's positive. Um, on the second point about higher level systems change, the idea there was that we would use the collective influence of our now 1,200 signatories in the UK to persuade the British government that the built environment has a lot of the solutions uh, that are needed, and here's what we need you, government, to do. And so far, they've refused to engage in meaningful dialogue. So we're planning to step up the pressure. And unfortunately, our government is, or appears to be more interested in governing in the interests of their funders than in the interests of the people. And, and it's time to call it out. So that is what we intend to do. And, and for me, that it really is one of the main obstacles. It, it's not about a shortage of money or a lack of the right solutions. We've had the solutions for a long time. It's mainly about a lack of political will. And picking up on your question, Sean, about how is this received, um, there, there was a, a sort of mixture, um, and I think it's fair to say that some people have really taken this seriously in terms of practices, and they've used this to really rethink what they do, and others perhaps have added their names without changing much. Um, 
And you know, that latter um, one, that's a little disappointing, but it's still useful for us to have a large number of signatories because that makes us more persuasive when we approach the, the, the British government. Thanks. Um, I want to continue a bit on this idea of literacy and, and getting people on board and, and, and being public about it. And we probably have a lot of practitioners in the room and online today who want to talk about this and want to want to do this. You know, they're committed. They, they came to this conference. Um, and so how, how, can, how, how do you tell other architects, designers to talk about this, regenerative architecture, to lay people, to people that you know, may not understand buzzwords, might, not, might have seen net zero and kind of know, not know what it is. How do we bridge the gap between like, the specialized knowledge um, that we're talking about today and kind of selling it to the public about why it matters and why, why this one, regenerative, matters and they've seen, the public has seen sustainability and, and, and all green architecture and those things before. Uh, maybe Craig, do you want to start as a as a principle of dialogue? How do you, when you're at a public meeting, how do you tell people about this? Well, uh, that's a good question, uh, Sean. Thanks. And, and there's no right answer, but but I think that um, preaching to people about what they have to do to be better human beings is not a good place to go. People do not like to be talked down to or told that they're doing things that are wrong. Um, what I think is a really good way to get people on board is to show them examples of what they could have, what they could experience, the kind of um, urban environment or building environment they could have um, if they just um, shifted gears, um, changed from using one material to another, um, were willing to live in a dense uh, urban environment rather than a suburban environment, as opposed to saying you can't live in a suburban environment, it's bad. You show them the benefits and the joys of being in an urban environment. I think it's, it's pro provide a vision and um, I, uh, the, the note, cast a vision of, as to what this looks like and why we would love to be part of it, why our families would benefit from it. The notion of the 15-minute city, for example, where you can walk to everything within 15 minutes. Well, that's a very concrete idea, and yet it has so many implications, positive implications. When we talk, we, the three of us, talk about regeneration, it's because we're nerds, and we're into the sort of nitty-gritty of what this means in systems theory. And, you know, Aldo Leopold is our hero, and uh, James Lovelock is, is someone that inspired us, but to the general public, that's all just just academic. So I think we have to provide really concrete images of the future that are compelling and attractive. Mm -hmm. uh, Nina Marie? Yeah, thanks. Uh, I build on that to say that designers have one great gift, which is the capacity for imagination and vision, and literally making those visions real. Is, is an incredibly powerful thing to do. Um, think of the analogy of Toronto, a very you know, multicultural city. We use that term, like, it's a very old term, but what we really mean is that we speak many languages. We come from many ways of being and knowing. And to tap into those with imagery that imagines a future that is possible and fair, just, is really what we're doing. And I think, I would say that the ecological literacy, if we can use that term, is really about bringing nature home, if you will. We are it and it is us. How do we help people connect with the living world within their daily lives in a way that is meaningful? So we can't talk about green architecture unless we help people understand from a health and wellness perspective, for example. Beginning with the individual connection is about being well. And COVID gave us an incredible opportunity at some immense cost to doing so, we suddenly, under years of long confinement, realize the value of the outdoors. What does that mean? It meant the opportunity to be with the city around us in ways that we're living and alive. And bringing that into our building is a really incredibly important thing to do. I don't mean house plants and doors necessarily. I mean really building differently with a landscape that sustains us. We have excellent data that show, for example, our cortisol or stress levels go down when we spend time outdoors. We can do that with smart, intelligent building with landscape, for example. We know that our children's attention spans increase when they 
spend even 15 minutes in green, what is called nature, but really we're showing in research means stratified urban vegetation. That is to say, not ornamental plantings. So we have really excellent data and talking about these projects in such a way that allows us to understand that our profound and deep connection to the living world starts right at home with the personal. It starts with mental health and wellness. And of course that means equity and access to those places and buildings. These can't just be showpieces or yet another demonstration project. So our language has to do with bringing nature home, if you will. Um, the final thing I'll just say on that point is that you know, we have an opportunity here to engage very diverse publics in our conversations in, in areas that matter. We know, for, again, that areas that, that suffer the most urban heat are often the poorest. Lack of shade cover, lack of trees. Um, so green streets planning extended across the cities makes a big difference for us. Each of our panelists have experience at different scales, and I think the conversation here is about linking across scales to make the city a place that is biophilic or connected to nature, regenerative, resilient. All of those terms matter, but most of all, what matters is it begins with health and wellness. Thanks. Michael, do you have another comment? Yeah, sure. So there's some interesting psychological research that's gone into uh, persuasive communication. And um, it seems like the, the best combination is to give people the truth about the, the particular problem you're dealing with in a way that relates to them, and then move as quickly as possible to a state of action about what can be done and how they can get involved. And if you overdo the negatives and, and fear factor, it triggers the wrong response, and it's actually more difficult for people to think rationally and, and creatively. And Nina Marie there was talking about uh, designers and their capacity for, for creating positive visions. And I, I do think that's a really important part of how you bring about change. Uh, Brian Eno talks very uh, persuasively about this. And, and he makes the point that all, all change starts in the imagination. And if you can uh, create a, a, a vision of a, of a new possibility, then people immediately start to compare reality with that possibility. And they start wanting that new reality to come into being. So by creating a vision, it kind of pulls this new reality into, into being. And, and by creating versions of that vision and, and then learning from that, sharing the knowledge and improving on it each time, that's a, a really important way in, in which we can bring about change. Thanks. Uh, maybe we'll play some Brian Eno during the interstitial time, uh, some good ambient. Um, I kind of have a related question, and again, it kind of goes back to you know the the reality that we're kind of living in in our cities. And this might be interesting because you know we have two Ontario practitioners here, and uh, Michael, who's from the UK, um, and in Ontario, in Canada right now, in Ontario, it's an election year. Um, there's there's kind of a hostility I feel towards you know green things um, you know there's gas tax protests and there's you know kind of these anti-climate marches and that sort of thing um, and our, our premier Ford I remember when he was on Toronto City Council about uh, 10 years ago you know Toronto had a low flow toilet program or something and I just remember him going on a big rant about low flow toilets and it's like oh the poor low flow toilets um, so that's the climate we're in and so and I know we have some politicians here I was just talking to a nice councillor from Guelph um, so if a politician um, or pol political adjacent folk um, want to talk about this, want to sell it uh, politically, um, how do you think, how should politicians, who are kind of different animals than you know, designers or, or civilians, how should politicians um, push this agenda? Craig, did you have a thought? Sorry, did you say Craig? Craig, yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, well, <laughs> that's a million dollar, billion dollar question, isn't it? Um, Democracies are, are wonderful things, but they're also very difficult to navigate. Um, and, I, and I think real democracies, governments listen to um, their constituents. So in a way, you cannot blame politicians for the kind of responses that they meet out. Um, I, again, to, to build on what we've said in the last question, I think it's all about um, casting positive visions about where we want to go as opposed to telling people they're bad for driving their um, SUVs or they're bad because they live in a particular neighborhood. Um, people do not like to be, to to be scolded and, and, and I think 
one of the one of the challenges is that I think that the uh, environmental movement has tended to be very scolding. Um, I, I think of Greta Thunberg. I mean, she she's a scold, um, and a wonderful scold. If you're an environmentalist, you you love what she says, but at the same time. Um, you know, if your way of life is dependent on all the things she's scolding you about, you tend to reject it. So, so I think it's about politicians, um, their policy makers getting smart about how this is put forward. And, and Michael is very, very right that there is a, there's good psychological underpinnings to how we move forward. And I, I think that that literacy of how to to cast the vision, how to set out the facts, not scolding people, but set out the facts, explain where we want to do, and cast that vision. Also, very, very parochially, Sean, I mean, the, the conservative government, the conservatives in this country have got to sort of get a better picture of what reality is about, right? Like, I mean, they're so far out of touch with reality. Um, but I think if, all of their interests align with a better future. It's not a political um, thing. It's a, it's a, it's just basic reality. Uh, Michael, from over here, it always seems like the Europe, the UK are ahead of us. Um, are you on, on this? On, like politically? They have a conservative government. Grass is greener, you know. Uh, no, no, no. Crazy. Well, there's a big difference between the UK, which is increasingly appearing like a failed state. Um, <laughs> And, and yeah, and our former um, close um, partners. Um, but um, you know, I think what, one of the really important things that we've got to do is to, is try and overcome the old binaries of left versus right and market versus state. Absolutely. And that's that's very at the moment that's very difficult when when you have populist leaders who seem to think that their best best way of sort of shoring up support is by creating culture wars and division. But what I'm talking about here is that um, you know, sometimes when I will propose an idea like the one that Craig mentioned, 15 Minute City, uh, which is a, a wonderful idea in, in lots of ways. It, it um, creates much more cohesive communities, much less dependent on cars and, and, and so on. And um, sometimes I get a reaction which is, well, that, that all sounds a bit communist. You know? I mean, who wants to live in China or Venezuela? And, so on? and you know, the, the point is that there's very different forms of kind of left-wing governments, and it doesn't have to involve a, a sort of Chinese state communism. If you look at the Scandinavian countries, they're, they're kind of left of center on the whole, and they've created a fantastic quality of life. Uh, Iceland is the best place in the world to, to be female. Norway has a, 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 an amazing welfare system. Finland has the best um, education system in the whole world. And if we could overcome some of these binaries, then we could we could learn a lot from that. And and similarly, uh, there's there's often an unhealthy binary between you know market versus state. And, and there's a place for each. You know, a, a company as successful as Apple, uh, the, the iPhone is based on five innovations all of which were the results of state funding. And there ought to be a way for some of that profit to come back to the state so that it can pay for further um, kind of blue sky research that, that makes for a more entrepreneurial uh, overall state. Mm. And uh, the, what I would describe as the kind of opposite to the old binaries is integrative thinking. And it might be counterintuitive, but often it is easier to solve problems when you embrace complexity. And I, I'll give you an example of this. So at the moment, there's a very hot debate within all European countries about fossil fuels and buying fossil fuels from, from Russia. So last year, the UK bought, uh, spent four billion pounds on oil from Russia. And for just three billion pounds, we could afford to make every bus fare in the UK free, which would be enormously helpful for people on, on low incomes. And it would also do a lot to improve journey times and reduce congestion on the roads. The government currently is planning to spend 28 billion on expanding the road network. If we got more people onto buses, we really wouldn't need to do that. We could spend that 28 billion on upgrading 
our buildings, which are amongst the leakiest in Europe. And so by that kind of integrative approach, we could improve life for people on low incomes, we could tackle obesity, congestion, climate change, and we could cut off all the funding to Putin's war machine. That's the kind of thing we could get with integrated thinking. Thanks. Uh, Nina and Marie, I've been following you on Instagram, um, and you post, you, your, your, your Instagram is a great window into your work and following your exploits in Los Angeles. And um, how was that? Did you have politicians come up? Like, what was the atmosphere there? Did, um, did, was there a lot of buy-in for the, the program? example of integrative thinking, um, what I guess in our lab we call integrative planning, we've been working on embracing complexity as literally as a topic title since 2008, and um, it takes time. This particular project, you know, has a lot of interesting stories behind it, not least of which the proponents were able to tap into psychological messaging about what would enact change. And, you know, I bring this back to your original question about how you motivate politicians. and. The question really was about health and wellness. Understanding how our own well-being is tied to something helps us act, not necessarily as individuals. There's a lot of downloading onto individuals, and I, I wouldn't say it's necessarily in my reading scolding people, although that's definitely one of the things that happens. It's really about truth-telling. And when you tell people too much of a truth that paralyzes them, they suffer from you know, a well-known phenomenon called eco-anxiety or you know, climate fright. And these are real, demonstrable uh, results now. And so I think we need to find a way, and we are finding a way to talk about how our own health and wellness can be improved by working together across these boundaries. Integrative planning for the California example, um, while perhaps not architecture specifically, certainly involves architecture. It was about actually showing people that their relationship to this particular animal that you know, was iconic for them. In this case, it's a cougar that is photographed very famously by Steve Winter in front of the Hollywood Hills sign, a National Geographic uh, photographer. That image was a catalyzing image for folks in California. And California is a little bit of a its own animal, if you'll forgive the pun. But this work was about capturing the public imagination about what that meant for people's own relationship to well-being in the city. And politicians were incredibly uh, forthcoming about this project. I mean, it's that said, this is a place that raised $97 million under the leadership of Beth Pratt of the National Wildlife Federation, um, something that we would not typically see here. Um, the lesson that we to take away from that, however, was that by telling the right story at the right moment, we can galvanize public action. And here, in, in, for, to bring it back to an Ontario context um, in which um, this organization is working, we do have language for that. It really is about wellness for a city that struggles at this point, where there are priority neighborhoods with green spaces out of reach, and where our projects in a state that still has, at this moment, public health and public education is an opportunity to invest. That investment's already been made. It's about how to recapitalize that and to engage people's interest in seeking those, reaping those um, benefit. So for example, the 15 minute city has been raised a number of times. We have a lot of plans across Toronto that are really about trying to green the city, whether it's in green streets with public transit rights of access and, and or rather right of ways, whether we have this in our storm water protection. These are all connected to the ways we build and that the stories that we tell ourselves really have to be about our own health and wellness. Thanks, Nina Marie. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, and we'll open it up to some audience questions. Um, and I know we have a lot of you know small small firms here, maybe independent people, independent architects running their own firm, and it's hard. I, all my architect friends will they disabuse me of my idea of wanting to be an architect um, because it's hard, and 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 getting clients, getting jobs, all of it. Um, and so, how does and I know it's probably easier, and you could disabuse me of this as well, easier for a bigger firm to push this agenda. I know, Craig, that Dialogue has a net zero commitment and that, but how does, what, would, what would your advice be for an independent or really small firm who believes in this stuff but is so worried about their own you know, personal economy and, and, and getting their firm work? How can they negotiate um, this landscape? Well, that's a tough question. Um... I think every, every firm has its own challenges, <clears throat> but um, I, I think the good news is that we're entering a time where there are a lot of clients that really care about this. 
um, and they'll be looking to practices of all size for uh, input and effective um, uh, solutions, ideas, uh, visions about how to go forward. Um, it's not like 10 years ago when it was like, what's zero carbon, what's regenerative? I, I think, um, Sean, you're writing in the star and others like you have given a context for people to be more aware. Um, so I don't think that architects should in any way be worried about um, showing that they care, um, uh, being conversant. <clears throat> Many of the ideas we're talking about now, I think you'll find very, very positive response. So I, I think it's a, a real opportunity as opposed to some sort of difficult challenge. I mean, architecture is a challenge to, to make ends meet anyway, but that aside, I think it's a time where a lot of people will be very receptive. I, I'm not sure if that answers the question or is too Pollyannish, but uh, for example, I don't, I don't have any clients right now that aren't asking about how they can do zero carbon. And that's commercial clients, institutional clients, educational clients. Um, it is, and it's, it's only happened in the last year or so that everyone seems to be on board. It's very interesting. If you're not doing it, then you're, you're gonna be left behind. Yeah, not, not Pollyanna, and Pollyanna is the, the way to be, I think, um, to get through life. Um, Michael, in your opening remarks, you said um, money doesn't matter, which I thought was uh, compelling, um, and, or something, something along that line. It's not about money. Money is not the hindrance to regenerative architecture. So for these, uh, advice for smaller um, firms. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure I exactly said money so, doesn't matter. I, I think um, what I was talking about there was that at a, at a national scale, it's not shortage of money that gotcha. is it's back. It's, it's a lack of political will. But, but coming to your question about smaller practices, well, I, I run a small practice, so um, you know, I'm familiar with, with some of the challenges. And I'm, I'm also familiar with what it's like to be you know, right on the um, sort of uh, bleeding edge of a, of a project. And uh, sometimes there are very real constraints, financially, programmatically, and, and so on. And sometimes, it, the best you can do is just choose one thing. It might be a material choice or a connection to the landscape or something. Just try and push that as far as you can in a regenerative direction. Learn from that, share that knowledge, and carry that forward to, to the next project. And the other thing I'd say is that, um, you know, assuming you can stay afloat, there are some advantages in, in being small. You can often take uh, greater risks if you become obsessed with growing your company and you, you start to take on quite a big um, kind of uh, workforce, then uh, it starts to become a sort of monster that you have to feed and it's, it can be more difficult to, to be choosy about your projects. So I would say to the small practitioners that you know, there's nothing wrong with being small. You, know, you, can, you can still be very influential. My, my company is still very small and, and I feel that we're, we're able to, to do the kind of work we want to and we tend not to pitch for work these days. Uh, and, and that's because, um, well, you know, you can waste a huge amount of time and end up with the wrong clients if you pitch for work. And sometimes it's better to just focus on being distinctive, know what you're good at, and just work with the clients that really want to work with you. Thanks, Michael. I made a corrective note, money does matter. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Nina Marie. Actually, yeah. there's a, I was looking up a, a quote just before this session, so it's a good one. I think it's from the back of Peter Drucker, who may know. And he says that a profit for a company is like oxygen for a person. If you don't get enough of it, you're out of the game. But if you think life is all about breathing, you're seriously missing something. Nice. Uh, Nina Marie, you work with a lot of students, uh, both at Harvard and here at Toronto Metropolitan University. Um, do you give them advice going, you know, because you talk, you, you talk about this stuff in your work, in, in, in your studios and in your classes. Um, how do you send them off into the world? Oh, well, there's two ways um, to talk about that. The first is that students bring fr incredibly fresh perspectives without a lot of baggage or bias uh, from practice, which means that they're really open to doing things differently and they understand the need for it. I would say that in bo at both uh, TMU and at Harvard, what we have in common is that we have experiential learning and standard in our studios, which means that every term our studios work with and within communities of practice in place. Uh, so they have a very clear idea of what is needed. 
and they have an unfettered way of bringing new vision to those projects. In fact, their graduation requires them, both particularly at TMU, but also at Harvard, to have studios that engage with their communities of practice quite deeply, which means that they take real practice experience into wherever it is that they're going to work. And I'd say that there is a generation of students right now, or at least uh, the last few cohorts, are very savvy about what needs to change, and they, they carry with them the expectation that we will be integrative in our thinking, collaborative in our making. And that's a really powerful asset, and I think firms certainly recognize that. Um, I hope that they don't get it beaten out of them in the first two years, and I'd say I'm seeing that they're not. They're bringing a change expectation with them. In fact, they're often driving change when you move into practice because they, as a group, collectively, have different expectations about what is valuable to live. Uh, they don't just live for weaving, for example, to touch back on Michael's quote. I'd also say they have a clear understanding that um, having the expectation of change downloaded onto the in individual is neither just nor appropriate. They have a tendency to believe that collective action is possible. And we see psychological surveys that bear this out about this particular cohort of students. I, I hesitate to say generation because to some extent it's across generation. The other thing I'll say is that in my own practice, I work with a lot of architects. I've learned tremendously from architects over my lifetime, um, thanks to many of them who've been important figures in my life. And this means that my own work as a planner and as a logical designer, just so to say, are, is really very integrative across these allied professional contexts in which we're all working. And it allows me then to encourage students as well to seek out those collaborations. I work with many small practices as kind of strategic advisor or sharing data that we generate through the work. And integrative planning, integrative design requires deep collaboration, not just multidisciplinary, but actually transdisciplinary thinking, something that emerges when we sit together to embrace the complex challenges that are both social, cultural, and ecological. So one piece of advice for small practitioners is take on collaborative projects that might surprise you, where you are not the weakest partner in the room, but actually contributing vitally for what you share and what you're able to do. We have seen architects brought into very unusual projects lately. Um, who would have imagined that Fast Company magazine that was traditionally about different types of work would be focused on collaborations between architects, ecologists, cyberneticists, for example. This kind of work is the definition of not only integration, but transformative collaboration. So I hope that that's a possibility. It also allows us to, for lack of a better term, share that knowledge with our clients who already come to the table with different sets of expectations, and setting the bar for them around this kind of work is really important. Thanks, Nina Marie. So I think uh, we have time for a couple questions. Um, there, there might be a roaming mic running around. Any hands? There's a, I see a hand here in the front. Um, if you just want to yell it out, I, I'll be, oh, here comes the mic now. Uh, this gentleman on the second table, uh, yeah, that guy, sorry. That guy, the, the, the nice looking gentleman. You can't see the audience, people just hear you describing it. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for the description. The, uh, we're about three weeks away from electing uh, government in Ontario, and if the polls are correct, uh, the lead, leading contender is directly um, uh, going to proceed with Highway 413, and this will initiate at least three decades of development outside of Toronto, uh, which will change the uh, environment dramatically and continue the suburban sprawl that we have. We've seen already what happened at Highway 407. Is it time for the Ontario Association of Architects to take a public position to be opposed to this highway before this election is held? and to call upon other professional groups, realizing that many of the people who support this are actually our clients. Yeah, should, um, should the OAA take a more politic public political stance? Um, I admit, speaking freely as a, as a writer, journalist on the outside of this stuff, I wish professional organizations would, because you have a lot of heft. Um, what, does our, what does our panel think? Is that an open question? Sure, yeah. Uh, no, open. Nina Marie, you want to talk? Well, I'm not a member of the OAA, but I am a member of the Ontario Professional Planners Institute. 
And I would say that I absolutely wish my organization would take a public stance on a catastrophic development, both for ecological, environmental, and human health reasons. Um, every part of that project is flawed. And I have said this publicly on many occasions, and I have, I will say, the privilege of an academic position in my life that allows me to speak freely. But I'm also a licensed professional, and I will not renew my license. Um, I will continue to practice in other ways. I will not use the term land use anymore, for example. That is an extractive term that is tied profoundly to the dispossession of people, land, and life. If the sooner we get rid of that term, the better. And it comes directly to the question you just asked, because it is about taking a stand on what is important for our own health and well-being and for that of all the other species that sustain us and for our future, our children, for example. They're one pretty good example, right? This is the future we're talking about. And if we continue to use the term in my profession, I'm speaking about uh, my own profession right now, as an example of how you may, you may take this at the OAA, as you wish, um, we're not, I'm a land-based practitioner. I'm based in that work. I can't do my work without a living landscape that sustains me. And the Highway 413 is a great place to begin that public conversation about what that really means. And Craig, I'd say that's not scolding in the language I'm using, I hope you heard it this way. That's truth telling. And it's also taking a stand because my position affords me the possibility to do that. I recognize that, but it also obligates me as a leader to make that statement. No more land use, land-based practice. And we start there. Thanks. If anyone wants to follow up, or we could go to another quick question. I can Michael? say quickly, and, and I, I'm only going to answer in sort of general terms because I don't really know the, um, the context in Ontario. But um, in Architects Declare, we carried out a survey of our members, essentially trying to establish how um, kind of outspoken they wanted us to be on certain issues. And, and there was an interesting consensus that came back, and, which was that a lot of our signatories said, we want you to be more radical than we feel able to be as an individual company because we have certain affiliations and so on. And so I think that is a clear advantage in, in getting together in industry groups, whether that's an institution or something like Architects Declare. So you know, in general terms, yes, I think uh, industry groups should speak out uh, about um, projects that that's threaten to uh, cause great damage. Thanks. Okay. Go ahead. I'll, I'll, oh, sorry. I'll, I'll speak to it, um, but not not to what the OAA should do. I think, as OAA members know, the OAA is a creature of the provincial government um, and a licensing body, so it's sort of not the right venue for protest. I think the RAIC, which is a collegial body, is probably closer to that. We don't have a, an association of architects, um, a collegial association in Ontario, unfortunately. Um, but I, I think this is a good example of a challenge that the environmental movement um, and people left of center have had in the, in the United States um, 10 to 15 years ago the Koch brothers started funding think tanks, right-wing think tanks, uh, to put their ideas out there. Uh, millions and millions of dollars and those ideas have become what we see um, in the right um, in the United States right now, and they're very influential. They weren't before, um, and I think ideas are really important, and they need to be supported. And I, I think what uh, Michael and Nina are doing with ideas are important, but we need to actually move policymakers and government, and move the opinion of the general population in the right direction. I, that re requires resources, so. Hopefully people will step up to do that because I think right now the the right in the world is uh, winning the fight um, in, in a way that all of our conversation here really doesn't impact that much But people that un care about what we care about have to get together and 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 push right? push our politicians Talk about it talk about it in media of various sorts um, It's it's a war of ideas um, and I think we're not being very effective at it. Uh, and so, yes, uh, you know, we should certainly oppose the 413 as a total disaster. It, redu it reduces density, it does all the things that uh, Michael and Nina talked about. But we've got to get better at moving our ideas forward.
Thanks. Um, I think we have to be about, about five minutes, just under five minutes. So um, I'll ask a quick one um, that was uh, messaged in from our online audience. Uh, can the panelists address how we are to inspire owners of building projects to do anything other than the minimum allowed by law or the code? It seems fairly clear that the majority of our buildings are built to code or less, and the landscape investment sees the minimum of its maximum. I doubt that the code minimum will be raised to the level needed to address our common future. So any really quick uh, uh, answers to how do you get the client to go above uh, the minimum? Whoever wants I to. I can start. start if you like. Sure. Um, so um, <clears throat> I think there's, a, there's a, a crucial stage in the earliest stages of any project where you have to try and raise the levels of, of ambition. And I think it's always good if you can get your clients to draw conclusions from themselves rather than trying to kind of force an opinion um, onto them. And I think if you can just explain clearly, perhaps using Bill Reed's diagram about the difference between sustainable and regenerative, if you could just clarify that difference and then ask the, the client what their long-term purpose is in life. There are very few clients that would honestly say they want their long-term purpose to be degenerative. And in the book that I've co-authored with Sarah Ichioka, we also talk about a, um, another um, exercise uh, developed by the Long Time Project, which encourages people to, to think about what it means to be a good ancestor. So connecting with deep purpose can be a really important way to shift things. Craig or Nina Marie? Yeah, thank you, Michael. I would say very much the same thing, that connecting with what really matters um, and tying that to personal, we've talked about this a couple of times in different ways, um, this, is a, this is a powerful motivator for clients. It's also very helpful economically to show how many times when we're doing something in a regenerative building, and our architects have used examples such to show this already, we stack our functions. We get multiple benefits from one investment. Um, we can point to lots of those um, around green roofs, for example. Uh, the benefits of the storm water, heating, cooling, um, and of course the, the visual beauty of them, and we're finding out actually the ecological benefits. So one investment, multiple benefits, takes you far above code. But that starts with connecting with your own purpose, your future, and your well-being. I'd argue that most, most clients, um, as Michael and Nina have said, are, are not setting out to create um, damaging degenerative buildings. Um, I, I think what your job is as a uh, architect designer is to show them how they can get to where they want to go. And if they're if they're commercial developers, they are working within a very tight pro forma um, that doesn't brook any any sort of additional costs. Um, so you have to figure out how you get to the most positive building possible um, within that. But I would say um, there are lots of clients that aren't interested. Don't waste your time with them. Find the clients that do. There's lots of clients out there. Work with them. Create inspiring examples. Forget about the, the, the people that don't care. You're not going to convince some people. Um, try and find people like you and, and move forward. Okay, one last question uh, from the uh, online audience. Um, could the panelists discuss the importance of, adapt of adaptive reuse in the preservation of embodied energy in existing buildings? This was actually something I wanted to ask too about teardowns. We're having some really major teardowns of apartment buildings in Toronto to rebuild up condominiums, replacing the, the rental. And it just seems a bit, um, it seems a bit over the top sometimes. Um, do you guys, do you, either any of you have like a 30 second answer to uh, the importance of adaptive reuse? Hugely, hugely important. Um, embodied carbon in all those buildings is, is so significant. Um, and um, I, I think First of all, it can't just be something that architects want to do. It's got to come in a, in a legislated form in many ways. But it is the big nut to crack. Uh, the, the number, the percentage of new buildings every year of the total building stock is somewhere in the order of 3 or 4%. If we can't figure out how to decarbonize um, existing building stock, we know the technology basically is electrification and reduction of, of energy use, um, then 
we're totally screwed. So we have to do this. It's an absolute must do. Essential, it's connected to the circular economy. It is how we make the argument to minimize extraction, to get beyond an extractive economy. It's also part of the unpleasant discussion of unbuilding, building for retreat concepts that we really need to think about under the climate emergency and biodiversity laws. Please, anything to reduce extraction is a good thing. Tying it to the circular economy is an argument that will work. It will give you the last word, Michael. Well, Craig and Nina Maria answered that brilliantly, so I'm not sure if I have much more to add. I guess the, um, the, the key thing really is to work out what makes sense to keep and what um, makes sense to upgrade. And you know, sometimes um, it, it does make sense to, to take off the facade of the building and put a much higher performance one in its place that's, that keeps the, the heat in and controls the light much more effectively and so on. And so, you know, we need to get better at, at making those kind of calculations, so seeing um, what are the elements that it really makes sense to keep and, and what needs to be upgraded. Cool. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank um, our panel, Craig, uh, Michael, and Nina Marie for this. Um, made my job easy. I, as a you know, writer of this stuff, I've been interested in regenerative architecture but didn't know enough about it. So selfishly, this was really helpful to me and it will probably appear in subsequent uh, stuff that I write. Um, so yeah, it's been a pleasure uh, talking about this with all of you and I'm glad the OAA uh, put this panel on. Um, a couple housekeeping things. Um, if you're taking the bus to the OA headquarters for the tour, um, those will, the buses will be out front um, and they won't leave without you um, and, and you can go there. Otherwise, um, there's the conference lounge. Uh, so have a refreshment, visit the sponsors. Um, if my own advice, if you need uh, you know, to skip out into the fresh air and it's a beautiful May Toronto day, um, walk across Lakeshore and walk around the part of Ontario Place that's been turned into Trillium Park. It's one of the most magnificent new landscapes in Toronto and you can watch the plains land and it's um, kind of glorious. So um, thank you for having me and thank you for um, being here.